Good evening. Thank you, Mirko. All right, let's take care of that. <laughs> it's a safe bet that everyone knows the two gentlemen seated here patiently waiting to speak, so I won't introduce them. Now, if someone does not know who James McMullen and Milton Glaser are, well, lucky you. You're about to make a wonderful discovery. For this conversation brings together two recipients of SVA's highest honor, the Master Series Award. Conceived in 1988 by SVA founder Silas Rhodes, the Master's Series has, in yearly retrospective since then, brought public recognition to the achievements of a who's who of designers, illustrators, art directors, and photographers. Milton Glaser followed Paul Rand as the second Master Series honoree, and James McMullen follows Edward Sorrell as the 24th. Between them, we have exhibited the works of Paul ba Saul Bass, Seymour Quast, Paul Davis, Jules Pfeiffer, George Lois, Mary Ellen Mark, Paul Asher, Massimo Vignelli, and many, many others, all of whom spoke right here in this amphitheater. So it is good to see you all here this evening, participating in this ongoing tradition. I trust that you, especially the students in this audience, will take something of value from this evening's conversation. Savor and enjoy the words of these masters. Ladies and gentlemen, Milton Glaser, James McMullen. Well, hello, everybody. It's a sweet night for me to be with my very dear friend, Jim McMullen who, since I've lived so long, I know forever, as a friend and colleague, and a companion through life. And we're going to have a little conversation about our parallel and different experiences in this curious profession of artist, illustrator, draftsman, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> we both love drawing. And Jim is an example of one of the great draftspersons. What is drafting anyhow? I mean, well, there's draft horses. Maybe it has something to do with that. It has that. something to do with dragging stuff behind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always wonder about illustrator coming from lustrare to shed light on. <clears throat> that I understand. But drafting, I never understood. Drawing which is to draw forth. I suppose you get something from the inside and you pull it out. It's a different drafting I never understood. But in any case, Jim loves drawing and he loves drafting and he loves illustrating. And it has been the centerpiece of his life. And he does it remarkably well, as all of you who know his work and saw the show can understand. And the first thing I was thinking about in terms of our conversation was uh, when he made the decision to spend his life doing this peculiar thing. I remember specifically specifically, and I tell this story often, of how I decided to spend my life doing it. It was when my cousin Eddie came in the house with paper bag and a pencil inside the bag. And he said, you want to see a horse? And I said, yes. I thought he had a little horse inside the bag. And he reached and he pulled out the pencil. He drew a horse on the side of the bag. And at that 
precise moment, I decided I would spend my life doing the same thing, which was creating miracles. Because the horse he drew really looked like a horse. And that was the moment I decided that forever, that's how I was going to spend my time. Do you have a comparable moment where at a single moment you decided that that was going to be the central activity of your life? Well, let me get back to your cousin Eddie for a minute. Um, he, he must have been really good, you know, because Maurice Sendak, when he was working on the book that eventually became Where the Wild Things Are, he originally called it Where the Wild Horses Are. And he decided that horses were so difficult to draw with all of their four legs that he couldn't do it, and he changed them into the monsters that they became. So Eddie was pretty good, you know, to, <laughs> to draw those horses. Um, I, uh, I, do, I, I, you have this terrific moment where you decided to become a, 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 an artist. And I, I think that I kind of sidled into it over my the years, you know, from when I was about seven till when I was about 12, uh, of copying comic books and um, being pretty good at it uh, and, and deciding that, uh, I, that I liked doing it. Uh, the other thing was that <clears throat> although I didn't really have any art classes when I was a kid, um, <clears throat> my family had these Chinese scrolls on the walls, these sort of long vertical scrolls. Well, tell us where you were. Oh, I, I was in a town called Chifu in, in northern China, and my grandparents were missionaries, and uh, uh, I was uh, born in, in that town. Um, anyway, these uh, scrolls, uh, I, I, they were there all the time. So it wasn't as though I walked into the living room and said, Eureka, these scrolls are beautiful. I'm going to be an artist. But nevertheless, they worked on me. And one of the things that worked on me was that they were so subtle. They were, uh, they were in these smoky kind of colors that, uh, that you could really, you had to pay attention to, to see. And I think that that subtlety uh, was a very early uh, influence in the way that I saw art. And once I decided to become an illustrator in Razzmatazz America, I had to overcome that instinct, you know, not to be so subtle and not to make things smoky and hard to see. And I, I have, over the years, managed to uh, to train myself to create some drama in my work. But oddly enough, uh, in these paintings that I am now doing, I'm sort of returning to that idea of pictures that demand that kind of attention from a viewer. But I was, uh, I was found them interesting. I always wanted to look at these paintings and find the little details in them. Uh, and I was also very, very struck by the fact that uh, with brush strokes, you could make bamboo leaves. And I remember <laughs> when I was about 11, I got a Chinese brush and some ink, and I practiced making bamboo leaves, and I got very good at it. So, you know, that, that's uh, part of uh, how I came to be an artist. And I think, you know, I was a kind of a sissy kid, not very good at sports, and I managed to impress people and keep uh, stronger boys at bay <laughs> by being able to draw Wonder Woman or, you know, to copy. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, Captain America. Uh, uh, so uh, art has always been a kind of refuge for me as well. All right. <laughs> well, you know, one of the most astonishing things <laughs> is when you hear stories from our generation and younger, of people who grew up, almost every but I ever spoke to who went into the so-called applied arts or painting started by copying comic strips. Mm -hmm. um, the universal training ground for everyone of our generation before and yeah. after over the last 75, 85 years was the comic strip, which became the training ground for anyone who wanted to ultimately enter the field of painting or illustration or the applied arts. It is absolutely remarkable how consistent that was as the way you learned how to enter into this revered field, whether it was at the high end or the low end. <laughs> Although the distinction between the two, the fine arts, so-called, and the applied arts or the commercial arts, but your basic way of entry, the, the point of entry, was the comic strip, curiously enough. And in all cases, when you talk about people's yeah. wanting to enter the field. It was always through the portal of the comic strip, which is a funny idea. But there and was we no weren't one clever enough to uh, keep doing comic strips and blow them up really big and be in the Museum of Modern Art, you know? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, where would Mr. Lichtenstein be without it? Uh, yeah. So, curious, curious thing. <clears throat> and also the idea that it gave you <clears throat> a kind of status and position in your own society, whether it was uh, your teenagers in high school or older, mm. that prevented you from uh, mm. being competitive in basketball or baseball yeah. or anything else. So many of us use that as our way of becoming significant in a very small community. So, uh, But you were aware of comic strips even in China at the time. Well, I actually, I wasn't aware of them till I went to school in India, and um, uh, which was when I was uh, nine and 10. And um, the American GIs uh, that were in the town of Darjeeling, where the school was, uh, gave us comic books. And I had never seen comic books until that time, so they were an incredible revelation to me. Yep. They, they, uh, they were- At the age of 11, was it? Well, it was like nine or 10. Nine yeah, or 10. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was funny. I remember my first professional experience, or experience with a professional, was after I had become known as, a, uh, as an artist, this was when I was seven or eight, um, and provided a service <laughs> to the young men of my area, basically the service was drawing naked girls doing unspeakable things. Um, and I realized that that was, uh, again, a, a service that was uh, very much admired by my uh, fellow teenagers. Uh, somebody heard that I was interested in that and knew a comic artist and arranged for an appointment for me to get some professional advice and I went down to 42nd Street in my first three-piece suit, blue wool, a very heavy, it was midsummer. I arrived at 42nd Street and I had to wait for a half hour. It was a three-piece suit. My father had acquired for me. The guy who sold it to him said, out of my hearing, but I heard nevertheless, it once belonged to a midget. <laughs> I waited in the lobby for a half hour. I came up to the little office of this professional cartoonist. It was covered with cigarette butts and had a small, miserable desk. It was far from the glamorous professional surroundings I expected for a comic strip professional to be in. I had a portfolio, I presented it, he looked at it, went through it quickly, couldn't have been more than two or three minutes. And I said, uh, do you have any advice? He said, yeah, he said, kid, he said, you know, when you draw those boxes around each of those strips, I said, yes, yes. He said, use a ruler. <laughs> <laughs> 
And that was my first bit of professional advice. Uh, how did you actually enter into professional life after you sort of begun to realize that that was what you wanted to do? Um, you ask hard questions. Um, <laughs> Easiest part. Well, well, I guess you know, but it, I, I was in the American Army for two years, and um, uh, I knew I wanted to be an artist at that point. In fact, I had gone to art school for a year before being in the Army. Um, so, um, I don't know, I, I just was a maniac to be an artist, and uh, uh, I, I made that decision uh, when uh, I came out of high school at 17, and um, I went to a small art school in Seattle, Washington. Then I was in the Army as an illustrator, drawing. What did that entail, being in the Army as an illustrator? I drew, uh, I drew the, the, the placement of loudspeakers on <laughs> Sherman tanks. Uh, I was in the Psychological Warfare Board. <laughs> So I did all the diagrams they needed, and then I ended up teaching officers how to design propaganda leaflets. <laughs> and uh, it's a measure of how little the Army knew how to do propaganda that I should end up teaching anyone how to do it. So, uh, and then when I came out of the Army, I went to Pratt Institute, and. Uh, um, I kept myself going by doing um, book covers for Vanity Press. I did them for $25 a piece. Uh, they were in three colors. Uh, I used press type for the titles. Um, and I, I got myself through um, two years at uh, Pratt doing that. And then um, I came out of the the uh, art school, and I started working for a man who was very important to both of us, Cyril Nelson, you know, at um, uh, Dutton Everyman Paperbacks. And um, this was an editor. He wasn't an art director. He was an editor, but he was very, very ambitious in what he wanted his paperbacks to look, look like. And um, he gave me my first professional job. And he said, well, you have to do the mechanical. And I said, I don't know how to do a mechanical, because of course I'd gone to art school, so I certainly hadn't learned anything as practical as doing a mechanical. Um, and he said, that's OK. Uh, here's uh, the finish on a book jacket done by Milton Glaser, and just copy what you he did. You never told me this. <laughs> <laughs> never heard this story. <laughs> So I learned how to, to put those uh, register marks down. and. Uh, oh, I know how to do that. Yeah, you, you were very good at it. Very neat. You did very neat, neat mechanicals. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. But uh, well, let me ask you something. During this time, early in your career, what, what were you looking at? What were the things that most influenced you, that you found most compelling, that you most wanted to be like, I mean, not in a professional sense, but in a, a sense of the things that really affected your vision, the things that most attracted you to the whole idea of being an artist and representing the world. And what was the universe that, that you found most interesting? Um, one of my teachers was Richard Lindner. And he was a very impressive guy, very short beautifully dressed with the most uh, beautiful shoes I had ever seen in my life. Great you know, shoes. Huge, welted shoes and just came in, you know, stomping with these gorgeous shoes into the classroom and uh, we all wanted to impress him. But Lindner uh, was my first conduit into German Expressionism and I was smitten when I uh, began to look at the work of Max uh, Beckman um, and all of the other German Expressionists, I, I, I was very, 
I loved the the immediacy of the drawing. You know that the, the they were. There was nothing slick about it. It was it was so visceral, and I I loved the sense of um, truthfulness or what I took to be truthfulness in the work. I it was totally against everything that was sort of going on in the 50s in our culture. You know, all of the smoothness, all of the um, euphemism, as it were, uh, about all of the things going on underground in people's lives. And um, that, that was uh, a, a very immediate um, kind of influence on me. I think it, it, it beginning even with the Chinese art, uh, linearness uh, has always been very, very important to me. I've never been interested in Turning forms in a in a very um, uh, in a way in which it, it conceals uh, the hand, you know, to, to make something magical in that sense has never interested me. So um, I think that that early exposure to the German expressionists has has never left me. I always kind of felt that influence, and for a long time. Not a long time, but for the first couple of years, I was drawing with bamboo pens that I carved and worked in diluted ink and everything. So I was very interested in using materials that were rough and and uh, as as um, physical as possible. You know. it's, it's curious, if I may be presumptuous, that isn't the a quality that I would associate with your work. I find your work much more refined, much more elegant, much less concerned with a kind of uh, direct, visceral, uh, this, the kind of direct, uninhibited power of German, almost the kind of uh, a vulgarity of the expressionist seems to be something that I would not think of when well, I think of your you, elegance. You can, you can be, as I am, um, temperamentally uh, connected to uh, immediacy without necessarily uh, being brutal about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can still want those qualities. And, uh, I think that once I began painting in watercolor, um, perhaps another side of me began to emerge, you know, uh, what you're calling elegance, I guess. Uh, but it's still very direct. I mean, one of the things in my painting of watercolor is that I never put one wash over the other. I, I'm always... Uh, working in one layer, and I only say this because in my mind uh, th that is the, the sense that you're making a stroke on the white paper and in that sense it's, it's visceral uh, to me, you know, it's, it has that quality of immediacy. Uh, well, no, even as, as you say that, when I think of Richard, uh, who, who was a friend and a, a lovely man, actually, uh, his work, of all the German expressions, was probably the most elegant. I yeah. mean, he was very... Well, I didn't like his work. I just liked what he led me to. <laughs> but, but his work wasn't brutal. I mean, yeah. it no, had... No, it wasn't, no. It, quite the contrary. It was quite refined and, yeah. and not yeah. uh, characteristically... Uh, not characteristically German, the way the rest yes, of the expressions right. were. So it, it, it was different. Uh, but beyond that, there were other, th other influences that you were looking at, certainly in the world of painting, besides the German expressionists that informed the way you were working. Uh, well, say, among the illustrators of the time, uh, not necessarily your peers or contemporaries, 
but of that uh, perhaps of a previous generation? Who, who were the ones that do you think informed your um, work? I don't know. Maybe Robert Fawcett, uh, because of the sense of drawing. Yeah. I, I, I like that a lot. But um, I, I seem always to refer uh, to English watercolor, you know. <laughs> My library is full of books on English watercolor, and they were very influential. Uh, Constable uh, was, you know, where there's both elegance and immediacy, wow. so uh, that. Well, we were talking about Turner the other day. And Turner, was, right, uh, right. Who certainly was uh, yeah. powerful and unusual. Uh, well, what, I mean, it, were there illustrators of the previous generation that you particularly liked or influenced you? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a lot of uh, 19th century illustrators were very important to me. Uh -huh. uh, and, um, <laughs> but my uh, appetite was as much for, uh, not a stylistic one, but a, a, a one about the attitude and the willingness to do anything rather than a stylistic idea, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> which was somewhat different. And then again, there was that whole world of, uh, of Paris and the turn of the century and, and the uh, appetite to discard everything and to just press through and to see where you could go, which uh, was to a large extent uh, an attitude we shared when we were working at Pushman and see how transgressive you could be and push through even the assumptions of modernism which we grew up in and, mm -hmm. and to see how much mischief we could make in the middle of a change that had occurred and that everybody assumed was the right way to work. I mean, the whole idea of just reintroducing illustration as an appropriate way to work was at the time transgressive when abstraction and, uh, and so-called design practice had become the coolest way to represent ideas. The idea that you could go back to narrative and pictorial means to represent the world was mischievous. I guess, you know, I, I th think that uh, I, know, I, I, I was, whatever uh, paths sort of opened up or, or changes that, that occurred, I never felt way above them making those decisions. It, it, it seemed as though the opportunities were uh, a combination of the, the commission I was given, the story I was given, uh, and how I emotionally connected. You know, what part of this story, what part of this play can, uh, can I find a connective bond with? So, um, you know, I think you have always been amazing in the way that you are almost seeing your work from um, a distance, as it were, and that you make these kinds of choices. I, I was always, I don't know, inside the work, moving uh, where, where I would at that point. I mean, you know, at times I had uh, interest in diagrams and maps, and you know, that uh, became a way to, to play against whatever commissions I was getting and saying, you know, how can I turn this job towards doing a diagram? Uh, 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 so uh, I guess in that sense, there, there were always uh, interests that kind of parallel the actual jobs I was getting. 
Um, but um, I guess I never saw myself as mischievous in that way. I, I just uh, saw myself as being uh, stubborn and uh, finding a way quietly to, to have my way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, I think that's a very interesting point, uh, the point I <clears throat> really never thought of, which was that uh, ultimately you're very interested in the narrative and in finding an alternative way of telling it. But fundamentally you are attached to the idea of narrative. Almost everything you do is driven by narrative, uh, and which is why theater is so appropriate for you. And I guess my interest is in violating the narrative mm -hmm. into kicking it over mm -hmm. and finding an excuse for offending it in some way and make you aware of it by negating it. Never thought of this. It may not even be true. But, <laughs> but to deal with the narratives, <clears throat> I wonder if I do that with people too. But to deal with the narrative as uh, a starting point to violate it and uh, make you aware of it uh, through negation. That's an interesting difference in how you use the subject. But it's um, not that it's better or worse, but it's a very different idea of how to make the narrative serve you. Uh, it never occurred to me that that's what I was doing. <laughs> if, in fact, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> well. Um, I've never, um, I, I suppose, I, I'm interested in explaining my process, but I've never been interested in making a larger intellectual framework for what I do. I mean, I think it's just sort of apparent what I do, and maybe uh, the intellectual ambition is not not there, so you know, it would be crazy to uh, to to give it this uh, larger idea of what I, you know, I I think that the the things that delight me, the things that make me feel I'm inventing something, are always uh, small and quite subtle within the work, but nevertheless very real to me. Um, there, there's a little painting in the show. Um, of Lenny Bruce shooting up uh, in, in a hotel room. And two things that really kept me going in feeling very excited about making that painting. One was the idea, how, how much can I, um, can I evoke uh, a, a certain atmosphere of seediness uh, in the picture. And secondly, can I create light in this picture uh, with flat shapes of white, you know? I mean, these are pretty simple things, and perhaps lots of people would have thought of them. But nevertheless, at the time that I was painting them, I couldn't think of another uh, illustrator who had done that, you know, that it was quite unlike uh, any other, I mean, first of all, if you're trying to establish light in a picture, a picture you, you do it uh, with, you know, uh, gradual fusions, or you, you know, you make uh, subtle gradations within uh, the light. And here, I was sort of baldly doing it with just big chunks of white paper. Uh, and it felt very exciting to me, but there's no, particular, um, I, I, I'm probably not being very mischievous in doing that, but in a, I guess in a way I'm, uh, I'm violating another idea about how you 
create light in a picture, you know. But, but, uh, um, one, one thing that uh, is very important, or I, I shouldn't say important because I'm, I'm not sure, I'm stuck with, you know, whoever I am and however I work, but um, I, I seem not to have developed in all my years of making pictures a dependable procedure. And sometimes when I'm really exhausted and frustrated in the middle of doing a poster, um, I wish that I had this way of saying, okay, I know how I could do it this way. I seem to always need to be in a slight state of crisis. And what it does, it, um, it, it, it brings forth a moment where uh, I, I kind of surge ahead, leaving behind all of the preparatory work that I have done. So um, I'm, I'm much more the victim of my work than you are, Milton. You, you are very much the master of your work, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm much more flailing around. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that's the thing that is so powerful about your work is that you, um, you, you, are, you, you have created something that you make the audience feel this is absolutely how it had to be. You know? Whereas I'm not sure what people think when they look at my work, but it probably isn't that. You know? uh, so th these are two differences about uh, how we work, uh, I, I, I think, you know, that um, this idea of, st for instance, you know, a large idea of starting with the idea of violation. Um, I would never start with that idea of violation, even though I may be uh, doing something that I have never done before in a particular way, but I don't think I ever start with that conception uh, of, of, of something that will guide me in, in, the, the, in the way I proceed. I currently think about it very differently, which is a kind of, uh, maybe I'm talking myself into the, a kind of collision of everything, that, that there really are no boundaries. Somebody said, what do you do? This is a student question, but it's frequently asked by <clears throat> anybody. What do you do when you experience doubt? Somebody was actually writing a book on this subject. What to do when you experience self-doubt? And they said... And you said, what? Doubt? <laughs> <laughs> I said something else. I said, embrace it. Uh, I mean, my favorite expression is certainty is a closing of the mind. Uh, how else could you approach anything except through doubt? The great thing that happens when you work is doubt. I mean, doubt is the condition of finding your way or stumbling in the dark. You. You can't do anything significant without doubt. I mean, uh, the, the mind operates through doubt. But uh, accepting that is not necessarily easy. So, um, well, what choice do we have? I mean, there is whenever, no, there is whenever no you're making something out of nothing, I mean, doubt is involved. So That's I mean, right. There I, is no I, choice. I don't even know how you can say that you have to embrace it because, uh, of course, you have to embrace it. What, what, but people, how, how would you people not don't, embrace doubt? But they don't. People don't embrace it. But they we're only concerned about you and I. Well, no, but <laughs> generally people are, are upset about doubt and they fear doubt. And they try to solve the problem of doubt. They say, how can I be more assured? How can I be certain that I won't fail? The, people say that all the time. They say, how but can I get certainty? That. Well, <laughs> some people feel that doubt is a condition to be avoided. 
And I don't know how you avoid it. I mean, you can, as you're saying, you can avoid it. No. So the question is, how do you make it an experience to be pursued? And I also feel that you basically have to integrate doubt as one of the things that enriches the experience of work, right? I mean, as you say, there is no choice about the things that are most meaningful in your work. If yeah. you have no doubt about what you're doing, there's something missing from what you're doing, right? Right, as a you're center. repeating. Right. You're, 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 you're basically, yeah. if you know what you're doing before you do it, there's something wrong. Yeah. yeah. So, and that, but that is a very, I think, a very difficult experience to arrive at. And, and I think, fundamentally, it makes the <laughs> distinction between significant work and work that is essentially a repetition of what you have already succeeded at, which ultimately becomes something that has no vitality and that you have lost the central reason for work, yeah. which is the discovery of what it is you do. So. Well, it, you said uh, previously that uh, I'm interested in narrative, which I definitely am. And you know, the weird thing is that just going back to these memoir paintings that are very much in my mind at the moment, is that uh, in doing these memoir paintings, I've never felt as much like an illustrator <laughs> Uh, in the sense that there is a story I so deeply want to tell, you know, even though in many ways I, they're, they're the most artistic things I think I've ever done. But, but um, I, I do always want, you know, that sense of, of, of narrative. And I think I want to be understood, you know. Um, I, I, the, I mean, that's the reason I don't think I could ever really have been a painter <clears throat> who goes off on a tangent where um, either no one understands what he's doing or very few people understand, even though I understand <laughs> that um, some philosophic truths uh, can be gotten to in that way that cannot be gotten to through illustration. Um, we went to see that William Kentridge show together, you know. And uh, yeah. what I loved about his work is how much he wanted to communicate, you know. I mean, what he was communicating was on a very high level and, uh, and difficult, but you, you never got the feeling that he was playing some kind of game in which he wanted to obfuscate uh, and stop you from uh, understanding uh, him. So uh, I've just said that some fine artists uh, perhaps don't want to be understood that easily, but I, I'm very interested in someone like Kentridge who is working at an incredibly high level, and yet you feel this passion to be understood. Yeah. Quite so. <clears throat> I would agree with you on that. But I must say, speaking for myself, I don't care if anybody understands me or not. I mean, in terms of people understanding what moved me or affected me, it's of no significance to me. But I'd like, I'd like everybody to look at those paintings again, if we could get them up again. These are um, so powerful and so essentially uh, as both simple and complex simultaneously, and so beautifully drawn uh, as anything that you've ever done, and coming at the end of years and years of study and observation, they just uh, I find them as as moving as anything that I've ever seen of yours. And uh, they also are so uh, reductive and simple in their composition and uh, clarity. 
that they uh, achieve a kind of uh, inevitable sense of form that uh, is deeply, deeply satisfying. Uh, I think not only to me, but to everyone who's seen them, that, that whose judgment I have any respect <laughs> for. Oh, thank I, you. I, thank you. I'm yeah. very, very moved by these, yeah. and very it's, happy that they come at this point in your, in your life. Well, it's, it's finally, I'm not telling someone else's story, I'm telling my story, you know, and I'm telling it uh, ba based on writing, uh, the writing in the memoir, which is already um, an act of uh, reduction and control, you know, that uh, it's, it's not just, uh, just the events in my life, in my early life, but it's the events, uh, um, uh, m modulated and, and um, made into a story. So um, it, it's been uh, very, it's just been great to work, work on these things. Um, but I couldn't have done them, I don't think, 10 years ago. Um, anyway, <laughs> well, that's they are what they are. significant <laughs> that you couldn't. Yeah. Very <clears throat> beautiful. I, I think um, maybe we should elicit some uh, response from the I audience. Think that would be nice, and yeah. uh, if you have some questions you want to ask directly, I think. Doug. Would... No, I'm sorry. It's not Doug. But you'll have to project okay. in order for us to understand. Maybe you should stand. Mm. Early in the talk, you said that art was a refuge. But later in the talk, you expressed that um, art was a uh, moment of disorganized thought. So how do you, in a quite kind of crisis, a state of crisis you described, so how do you reconcile the refuge State of crisis. Uh, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry to say. Did you hear that? I did. Okay. I did, yeah. The, um, he's, he, he says that I claim both that art is a refuge, but that in the act of my doing the art, uh, I'm in a state of crisis. Uh, the, the whole uh, activity of art is the refuge, but within that activity, how I get to the consequences of the art um, is, is, is this somewhat chaotic uh, way of working that uh, seems to have to stir up a, a certain amount of anxiety until uh, something occurs. I don't know, some of you may have seen either my poster book or my my earlier book called uh, Revealing Illustrations, and uh, you uh, see from that that um, I go through many stages in doing any kind of image, uh, and, and, and they're not beautiful stages. They're, they're, a, a lot of the stages are really quite, quite ugly and um, unsatisfying and, and low, low class. <laughs> um, but they seem necessary for me to uh, finally provoke myself into um, making this invention that turns everything. And when it just happens, um, there are various degrees of this, but when it happens, uh, the moment is fairly clear to me that it is happening, that, that I am doing something that finally brings the elements together, or in most cases, has has gotten rid of a great deal of stuff. I, a, a lot of my work is extremely reductive, even though people think my pictures are complicated. The, 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 the way I feel when I'm working is that I'm getting rid of the bad stuff, you know, and getting to something essential, some kind of core element. <clears throat> yes. Uh, the first one is, why do you say you couldn't do this 10 years ago? And the second one is, 
So much of your paintings are about working with models. Could you talk about performance in painting and how that, what that means to you? I guess directing the, the you know, working with an, an actor sort of for your, with your theater pieces? Uh, I'm not sure I can actually answer the question. I sort of know uh, instinctively that uh, the moment came. Part of it was that uh, my father had written many, many letters to my mother during the war. And I'd always sort of avoided these letters. Once in a while, I would look at part of a letter. But there was something I didn't want to deal with about the letters. And maybe it was just thinking about him or, uh, but anyway, I took a, a couple of, uh, well, quite a few months actually, and I organized the letters by time. I read all of them, I made notes of them. I immersed myself in my family history. And even though the, the letters didn't uh, directly uh, deal with some of the things that I finally ended up dealing with in the memoir, they they prepared me emotionally, I think, to finally face it and, and start to think uh, about, about you know, this history and organize it. And the, the other, the, the other uh, point you make is a very good one, which is that I've always, uh, I've always been very excited by the, uh, the details, the, the idiosyncrasies of looking at a real person uh, in the world, uh, either making a gesture or just sitting there or whatever it is. But it's always been very stimulating for me to take the trouble to find models, to make photographs, to go through all of that stuff. you know. And a lot of my work has been based on that. Uh, when I finally came to doing the memoir, I thought at first I would do the same thing. I would find a little boy who was like somehow the right kind of model for play me and find someone to play my mother. Uh, and then I said, no, I, it's in my head in a way. And even though uh, I use reference, uh, you know, to look at uh, what a Chinese temple looked like in, in a particular time or in a particular place or some other detail like that, these pictures are basically done out of my head. And um, it's the first time uh, that I've done that and have trusted myself to do that. It's also, uh, I think I would have done it more in my life had it not been for the fact that when someone uh, commissions me to do a job, there's a certain expectation. And one of the expectations is that they will get a degree of realism that they associate with my work. And I suppose, you know, that, um, that to some degree, um, I, I had to fulfill that. Um, but in this case, uh, I don't have to fulfill any of those expectations. So I've been able to work entirely from my head. And actually, I think it, I'll find it rather difficult to return to the elaborateness of working from models and so forth. I, probably will have to, but uh, it's been, uh, I've learned a lot about myself, about my possibilities in art uh, by letting go of that, you know, I really let go of it. And as much as I love to draw the figure and uh, love to have that sense of realism, uh, and it's not just a sense of realism, quite frankly, because I don't even think I'm, in my work I'm that realistic. Um, uh, but my, my, if I have a model uh, for my posters, it is Toulouse-Lautrec. And the thing that is the model for me in Toulouse's work is how he looked at all of the crazy stuff that a figure uh, sitting at a cafe table or uh, dancing. Uh, it, he was so in love with the, the world in that way. And I, I too, love that uh, kind of idiosyncrasy that you can only get from looking at real people, 
you know, doing stuff. Uh, so certainly in terms of the posters, uh, that has been my pleasure and my method to, uh, to do it. And since I quite often get to work with actors who really know how to move and really have faces, uh, it's, it's very interesting to do that. I have a question. Um, besides yourselves, there are two other veterans of the Pushpin studio here this evening. Uh, there's Paul Davis and Edward Sorrell. And I was wondering, uh, Jim, if you could talk a little bit about your experience in this uh, fabled studio. Well, uh, I, I came to the studio because Seymour Quast and I were in a, um, a drawing group together where we hired models and drew stuff. And I got to, to know Seymour in that. And at the time, uh, I was uh, being ripped off uh, in the usual way by all my clients uh, who would uh, commission me to do something and then not want to pay for it and all that stuff. So I was always kvetching to uh, Seymour about my poor life. And uh, so finally, he. He um, said, well, come work for us uh, at Pushpin Studios. And uh, um, I knew it was a huge honor to be asked, and indeed it was a huge honor. Uh, I was very nervous to come and be interviewed by Mr. Milton Glazer. Um, and I forget how that interview went, but uh, I got hired. Um, but the thing that happened that was so wonderful and for which I will forever be grateful to Milton was that when it came time for the studio to send out a card announcing that there, this new person had joined the studio, he took this very uh, strange little painting I had done a still life over a photograph, and he chose it as what the studio would send out. And it was such a, um, uh, you, you had s said, you know, you, you're an artist, and, and we, we want you here. And uh, because it was a totally useless painting in terms of uh, getting work or in, uh, I, and I was replacing, um, and a man called Isidore Seltzer, who had been incredibly useful to the studio and had churned out uh, lots of work and I'm sure made Milton and Seymour lots of money. Uh, so uh, it was interesting and, and uh, delightful that uh, Mil Milton did that. However, once I began working there, uh, it was hard to fit me in to uh, the sort of style of the studio because I, I was not, you know, I was, uh, my work was not very flat and stylized and that was what it was, uh, the studio was very, very famous for. Um, eventually I went out and got my own clients <laughs> and uh, it, it continued, but it was, um, I learned so much, you know, I mean, it, uh, uh, it totally went against every bone in my body what they were doing, all this flatness. And, uh, but I, of course, was learning a great deal about simplifying my work, about uh, patterning, uh, and about conceptualizing, because Milton was always talking about the large idea. So I was forced to think about the large idea. Um, so it, it, it was terrific. And then, when I left the studio, um, I wasn't fired. Um, uh, Milton and Clay Felker had just started uh, New York Magazine, and it was perfect timing because I immediately began to work for New York Magazine, and um, it was the huge transition in my life. Doing the work at New York Magazine uh, really gave me the opportunity to begin to grow to, you know, um, uh, and, you know, I did the 
I did the Saturday Night Fever paintings. I, I did a lot of stuff at uh, New York Magazine. It was a very influential thing. So it was really, for me, it was the combination of what I learned from working besides, beside uh, Milton and Seymour, uh, but also what happened immediately afterwards, which was this um, huge opportunity for all of us. I mean, it was uh, uh, New York Magazine changed the world. Um, so um, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, Francis, but. <laughs> Um, you, you sort of touched on this in, in your recent comments just now, but I'm, I'm curious to know if you ever felt in the course of your career, maybe it was something that came and went. Um, I'm not hearing. Uh, can you hear me? No, well, maybe now I am. Oh, I'm curious to know if in the course of your career, um, you know, maybe from your first paid assignment through, um, if you felt sort of a conflict between what you wanted to do as an artist and what you had to do as an illustrator, for a paid assignment, and if it was something that just naturally kind of gelled what you wanted to do and how you wanted to do it and what the job was, or if it was something that you had to really work towards reconciling and kind of getting your voice into the work that you did as paid assignments. I, I didn't hear that. The, what well, uh, <laughs> um, did, did you have to work towards doing the work you wanted to do rather than the work that you were asked to do? Well, I think that's always a question for anybody who works for a living, for one thing. There is this uh, mythology about what you have to do in working in the field. The field is always between you and your life and your work, and a client who has their own needs. And it's always an accommodation of the client's need and your aspiration. Um, there is no work that doesn't involve a third party. There also is an audience that shapes the requirement for your work. And so it's really a triad between you, your client, and the nature of the audience. You never get to do what you want independently, but that is the game itself. And there's a delusion about it that it has to do with what you want, which is <clears throat> totally untrue. Unfortunately, it's also continually being taught by the schools who always have this myth about the universal genius that has something to bring to the table that is independent of the audience and the client. Totally nonsensical, but persistent. So every job you ever do and ever will do involves this conversation between an audience, a client, and yourself. And they are never separate from that series of peculiar and ongoing relationships, which is a triad, and which always has to be accommodating. And everything changes constantly. The audience changes, the client changes. And paradoxically, you change too. So there is no constancy in that relationship. And so the question fundamentally always is a question that changes with every situation and all the players. Does that answer the question or merely complicate it? <laughs> I think, however, I, I would just say that uh, it, what Milton has said is entirely true, but nevertheless, um, in order for the work to be good, there has to be joy within the making of it, or what maybe joy is uh, too uh, 
too flighty a word, but um, there, there has to be uh, some kind of personal satisfaction and, and uh, that really is in a way independent of the client. I mean, the client has to be satisfied, obviously, but um, in, in the midst, I, I feel that you know, the best work is done when you understand the parameters of what you're dealing with and what has to be conveyed. But at the same time, somewhere in the process of doing the job, you find a moment that is just between you and the work, you know. Uh, and to answer your question in a slightly different way about how you, you know, how you find what you want to do, um, I think it takes a certain kind of um, persistence, a certain kind of belief in yourself uh, to keep moving towards what you want to do. Uh, and the, the other thing is that, of course, you're always sending signals, you know, for anyone who's working a lot, you're always sending signals out into the world. This is who I am, this is what my work is about, this is how I feel, this is... So, uh, you know, uh, hopefully uh, the work becomes appropriate at some point. It becomes appropriate to who you are, uh, you know, uh, what your possibilities and limitations are. Um, so, um, so I, I do, I mean, I, I think that everyone wants that. They, they want to do work that is uh, uh, truly enjoyable. Um, I think that both Milton and I, because we have taught a lot, there's a tendency to want to uh, sort of prick the bubble, <laughs> you know, that uh, that the world is waiting for your most uh, personal work, that the world is probably not waiting for that, and uh, that uh, you, you have to learn how to do good work uh, with, within the restrictions of, uh, of, the, of the real world. Um, but it, it, one thing I feel is that as much trouble as the people at Lincoln Center Theater give me, and they give me a hell of a lot of trouble. Uh, in another way, I've educated them to understand what I can do for them. And I think with any good client, that is part of the interaction, is that you're also educating your client. This is what I can do for you. It is really good. It will serve your purposes. You've never encountered it before. You're going to have to get used to it, but trust me, you know that that, that you give them a sense of uh, that that they're in good hands and that that you do understand what uh, you're doing. And Milton, by the way, is incredibly good at uh, uh, convincing clients that that even though they have never seen this kind of work before, that's exactly what they have been hoping for. <laughs> well. It's it's just worth talking about because it's, for many of us, the most essential part of any job. It's, it's quite removed from our talent or ability. And sometimes the agenda of the, the client, as it is in personal relationship, is to make you fail and to make the project fail. And in those cases, it doesn't matter what you do. Every case is unique. And every circumstance really is almost starting from scratch. I'd love to feel that I could go into a situation on the basis of my virtue, intelligence, talent, and experience, guarantee that I'm going to succeed. But alas, that is not true. And even in those situations where I feel that the client is sympathetic, and understanding, and I am so talented that I will succeed this time. Sadly, it doesn't always happen. Uh, it is a, a, a dialectic that does not 
have guaranteed outcomes, no matter what the circumstances. It's like a love affair where everything seems to be absolutely right until it, it all turns to garbage before your eyes. <laughs> but it is the nature of the game. And I feel a what? little uncomfortable <laughs> with this line of, of focusing on all of the, the, the rejection we've had. I mean, the fact is that you and I have had the privilege of doing a hell of a lot of good work. That, and, and I was about know, to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> The nice thing that happens also is that where <laughs> failure seems to be inevitable, it sometimes turns into gold. <laughs> and so the nice thing about it is that it is also unpredictable. And in the face of terrible clients and inevitable failure, you sometimes get out and do an extraordinary job, even though everything would seem to indicate the opposite. Uh, and I am very happy to say that I have, on occasion, experienced a success where failure seemed inevitable. So you never know. <laughs> and under the worst circumstance, you have occasionally produced your best work. Don't count on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're here to be a wet blanket. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's, it's a great thing to be an artist and to make a living at it. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's an amazing thing, you know. And, uh, I have a question um, for Jim. I actually have three, but I don't know how much time there is. Uh, you, you have an extraordinary ability, I think, to not fill in every inch. And sometimes you, you fill in a fair amount, and sometimes magnificently detailed carpet and stuff, uh, the way you did the water uh, in, there's a man diving into a pool, extraordinary not real, but completely real. How do you know when, when to fill it in and when to hold back and stop? I'm thinking particularly of a piece downstairs. I think it's, um, I think it's a, a, a robbery, and there are figures fleeing out uh, the window, which are quite clear, and there are also what I would call shadow figures, but they're linear. Uh, and a chair tumbled over. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah. It's the Bader Meinhof gang's escape from a library. Right. right. How to come to that delicate balance to be theatrical? Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Uh, well, as I said before, I, I think uh, one of my basic instincts is to to reduce to you know uh, is is not additive. I am amazed as I look at some of my earlier work at how patient I was, how many details I was able to put in things. I, I can't do it anymore and I'm not interested in doing it any, anymore. I, I think my instinct is more reductive than ever. Um, I, I don't think of myself as uh, someone that is adding things. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, I, I think the interesting thing about the work that Milton and I do is that every problem creates different pathways in your mind. You, you, you say, okay, this is my problem uh, today, and uh, this, these are, this is the story or whatever it is. And, and so it, it stimulates you to do a picture that, uh, or a, a symbol or whatever that you've never done before, you know. So I would say in the Bader Meinhof uh, situation, I never did another picture like that. Uh, it was very much the circumstance of what had to be conveyed and how I felt about it. And uh, um, so I, 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 I can't give you a practical answer of, of like, 
you're working on a picture, and do I add or don't I add? I don't know. You know, it's just it's just like one of those things that's so intuitive that uh, I, I'm not sure that there's any one answer for for that. <clears throat> Just one question for you, Jim. Um, your choice of, speaking of pathways in the mind, your choice of gold um, in this, in this uh, memoir. What's well, gold, I, I'm, I'm struck by gold, and then of course the, the purple, or the lavender. Does that have any part, is that part of memory, or? Well, it's, uh, the, when I started to, fool around <clears throat> how I was going to do these pictures. Um, I rather intuitively painted a picture with a lot of black and, and purple in it, you know. And <clears throat> uh, what, what it struck me when I did it was that the color was so artificial. It was definitely a color of imagination, a color of art and not of reality. And uh, it helped me to see the pictures in this kind of dreamlike way, that the color was so uh, intuitive, not realistic, really. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's my answer. Uh, it, it sort of came about uh, in a kind of intuitive, moment of, uh, of doing sketches and seeing how I would do the pictures. But it became very important that, that the color, uh, as I say, was so artificial that it, it, uh, I said, this, this, is the, this is a kind of key to what I want to do here. Uh, so that's, that's my answer to that question. No? Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. Make sure you grab a catalog and the thing on the rack.